We have Rakesh Satyal with us today, really excited, mm -hmm. um, award-winning <laughs> author and editor, teaches at NYU, sings cabaret, That's and great. check that show out, it's great, <laughs> and very, very close friend of mine. So we are super thrilled to have you here, Rakesh. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you us. for having me. Um, he has gotten some incredible press lately with the launch of his second book, No One Can Pronounce My Name. If, am I pronouncing your name correctly? You are. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. After all these years, you're now asking me after like <laughs> no, 15 years. It's been 20 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I, welcome and welcome to Google. Um, I thought maybe you could do a quick intro for everyone. Tell us a little bit about yourself that I haven't sure. already told everyone. Yeah, so I, uh, this, as Melissa said, this is my second novel, which just went on sale in May. Uh, my first novel, Blue Boy, went on sale in 2009. It's, it shows you how lazy I am, so I'll see you in eight years. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I grew up in uh, Ohio, so both books actually take place in Ohio. Um, the first one takes place in Cincinnati, which is my hometown, and this latest one takes place primarily in Cleveland. Uh, and I've worked in book publishing for more than a dozen years. Uh, I actually began my publishing career as an intern at what was then known at the Doubleday Broadway Publishing Group, which is part of Random House. Uh, and I worked for a legendary editor there who's still there, who um, was a wonderful mentor. So I worked for him for, then I, after I graduated, I, we actually graduated from college and the following Monday I started working for him as his, his assistant. So that was very fortuitous to intern for him. Uh, and then I worked there for about four and a half years, uh, and then I moved over to HarperCollins, where I worked for another four, five years. Uh, and some of the bigger authors I worked with when I was at Harper that I edited were uh, Paul Rudnick, uh, Paolo Quelu, who wrote The Alchemist, uh, Clive Barker, Armstead Maupin, who wrote Tale The Tales of the City series, who has a new memoir coming out this fall. Uh, and then I actually had a detour closer to your world of things where I worked uh, at Lexicon Branding in, in Sausalito, California, doing naming work. Uh, so I worked there for a while and was in the world of branding for about three years, all told, doing naming work uh, back here in New York as well. And then uh, I went back into publishing, which is a rarity. Uh, people sometimes leave and they don't go back. Uh, but I really missed working with authors. I really love working on, I love editing their work. I love conceptualizing their work with them. So I work at Atria Books, which is a division of Simon & Schuster, where I primarily work on narrative nonfiction, and then I do some literary fiction as well. Uh, some books that I'm working on currently, uh, actually this past Tuesday, my author Janet Mock's new memoir went on sale, Surpassing Certainty, which is wonderful. Uh, I have a memoir coming out this fall by the TV writer Michael Ossiello, who wrote a really popular column for Entertainment Weekly for a long time called Ask Ossiello. I'm glad you know who he is. Uh, and uh, we actually just got an amazing blurb for that book from J.J. Abrams, uh, so that's very exciting. Uh, and I'm doing um, Jake Shears' memoir, who's the lead singer of Scissor Sisters, that band, which goes on sale next spring. So that's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, and then I have an Italian novel that I'm really excited about next March. Uh, called The Eight Mountains by a writer named Paolo Cognetti, uh, which is a short novel, about 200 pages, about the lifelong friendship between two Italian boys who meet in the Alps when they're young, One's from, one who's from a family of privilege and one who's kind of from salt of the earth mountain family. And it's sort of like, people comment, it's like a male Elena Ferrante. It's that kind of storytelling. It's really beautiful. So, so that's kind of my professional life. Uh, and then uh, it's been really exciting having this out. So uh, I wear both hats, including this awful baseball cap. Uh, and so I do, do it all. So that's some thing about me, <laughs> some 500 things about me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I want to talk about the book in a second, but I first wanted to ask you a bit about your process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's your second novel. You know, how do you work? What's, you know, how is it different maybe from the first one? Tell us a little bit about how sort of, you know, you came to, to finish this. Yeah, I, you know, I tell all my authors all the time when I'm working with them, you know, have a real, be very regimented, have a schedule, write every day. I'm a complete hypocrite because I don't do any of that. Uh, I feel like since I'm a taskmaster in that job, I can just sort of fudge it on my end. Uh, you know, it's very, it was very instructive working on a second book. Uh, I know you hear about sophomore slumps and you hear about you know, going back to the well and how difficult it can be. With the first book, I think most people, you feel an urgency to kind of tell your story, to get your voice out into the world. There's a certain propulsion behind that to get your, you know, get your thoughts that you've had kicking around in your head for quite some time out and onto the page and then into people's hands. And 
as with many writers, my first book was semi-autobiographical. I mean, more of it is conjured than people might think. But that had a certain movement to it, because I felt an urgency about it. I felt like I knew who the characters were. I knew that the character would be written in first person. It would be the 12-year-old Indian boy. The first book, Blue Boy, is about um, takes place in a very fixed period of time in the life of a 12-year-old Indian American boy growing up in the Midwest who thinks he's the reincarnation of Krishna, the Hindu god. So uh, there's a, almost a construct in the, uh, established at the beginning of that book where he goes through certain exercises to almost make his life match the life of Krishna. So there was almost a road map I created for myself to, to finish that book. And it was just a question of pushing myself to do it. Uh, this book was very different because I began writing it not sure if it was going to be a short story or what it was really going to end up being. And what happened is that the, the central relationship in the book is there are two main characters in the book. One um, is a middle-aged Indian man. In his, he lives, he's in his mid-40s. He lives in Cleveland with his mother. And you find out at the beginning of the book that um, well, I might read from that later, so I'll tell you what you find out later. But, but that's one of the main characters. And the other character is a woman in her mid-40s who has just seen her first, her only child, her son, off to college and is sort of unhappily married. And to keep herself enthused, she writes paranormal romances as a secret. So it's about the, how the two of them become friends. But that, may, that first character I mentioned, he came from the idea that years ago I had a family friend whose uncle came to town to visit. And if you know Indian people, uncle, it's a catch-all term that can mean anything from an actual uncle to some tenuous familial connection that you don't even like. So, uh, so we, I met a, f a family friend of his who was in his mid-40s. He was unmarried. He lived with his mother in New Jersey. And I remember everybody having this implicit understanding about him that because all of those things were true, he had to be gay. Because that was the only reason that could explain that, that having that kind of life, so to speak. And I remember being doubly disheartened by that, because one, I was obviously a closeted teenager in the Midwest and, and found that, that kind of gossip not particularly encouraging. But also, in addition to that, and an extension of that, that people were framing his life for him. There was no, he had no agency in the way that people were talking about him and what his story might be. So I started writing that character. I felt like, because my first book was a younger character. There were certain queer themes that were explored, and I felt a responsibility to kind of talk about people at a different point in their lives. And to be completely frank, when I was writing that character initially, I was incredibly lonely in my life. I was single, not happily single. And I was dealing with all of these issues of like kind of w what it means to be lonely. And, and if, if that's your default state, if that can be made productive at all. And the more I began to write that character, actually, when I initially started writing him, I didn't really think about necessarily what his sexuality was going to be. And then, the, and then when I thought about the themes I was really trying to capture and what I was trying to do with that character, I realized actually it's much more compelling if he is in fact, if he is in fact queer in some way and we, he doesn't even know what he thinks about the world. So because of that, and I, I, again, the laziness comes into play here because, I would, because there were different threads. There were those two main characters and then there were a lot of auxiliary characters and the book is told in close third person among them. I would get really lazy writing one character, not sure what was happening, and then I would just jump to the other one and start writing that. And then I would write, jump to the other one and start writing that. And then when you go back, it really makes your job much harder, because if you want to create a cohesive narrative as a writer, it's not great to do that to yourself, because you're like, oh, where was I? And what did this mean? And what was I thinking a year ago when I was writing that other section? So all this to say, I made it much harder for myself. It was much harder. Uh, but I've certainly learned things going into the next project I work on of like how not to do that, how to ke keep a better idea, a work ethic in mind that will keep me in track. Got it. Um, well, I think we should just keep talking about the book because uh, now that we've been introduced to yeah. one of the characters, <laughs> right, right, right. Um, maybe tell us, tell us a little bit more about some of the other characters' plot lines and um, maybe we can do a quick reading for yeah, everyone. Sure. Uh, so um, that's the main character. I'll read his section so you'll find out about him. Uh, the second character, Ranjana, is, like I said, she, she lives in Cleveland with her husband, uh, Mohan, uh, and they've just seen their, their only child, Prashanth, off to college, goes to Princeton. Uh, shocker for us. Um, so, uh, and she, yeah, because she feels very isolated. And one of the things I was exploring in her character in particular, both of them, both Harit, who's the, the other character in Ranjana, are people who haven't spent any um, copious amount of time thinking about, again, what agency they have in the world. Like, what, what are they allowed to feel? What are they allowed to talk about? And in her case, 
she realizes over the course of the book that she actually has quite a, a relatively sharp sense of humor. That that it, it's not just she's like incidentally funny because she's an Indian woman living in, in America and because she bumps up against people she doesn't know. But in fact, she can she can take what she knows about the world and actually employ it in a certain way in the way that she writes about the world and the way that she interacts with people that is closer to her actual personality. And she has a. It's like her personality is caught in her head, but it's not in practice at all. So that's really, I was exploring that with her character in terms of kind of um, taking a really feminist stance in a way of like how, how would she come into her own that way. And then the, the third main narrative in the book is Prashant, her son, who is a freshman in college. And in his case, uh, because he's he's kind of checked off all the boxes for his family. You know, he's very studious. He's a chemistry student. He's very sharp. Um, and he realizes that because he's been dutiful in a lot of ways, and because even when he's acted out, if he's like, you know, smoked pot at some point, or if he's gotten drunk like during high school with his friends, that nothing has really prepared him for the social interactions he's going to have romantically in his life. And so he, he develops a crush on this kind of stereotypically beautiful, and but then like kind of darkly smart um, young woman in his class that he has a crush on, and he realizes he doesn't know at all how to engage with anything romantic because his parents have set no example for him. So it's really the three of them, and then the other key character is Harit's mother, um, the main, the first character I mentioned. His mother is um, uh, later in life, and you find out in a particular flashback scene what the trajectory of her life has been up to that point. So it's really looking at people who are on the margins of society in a way and how they, they actually insert themselves into the conversation willfully as a result of the things that are happening around them. And tons of gay stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tons of gay people. Tons of gay stuff. Really funny, yeah. really beautiful, really sweet, touching story. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. I know you mentioned at the end of the acknowledgement how you credit your husband, John, yeah. um, how it started off in a sad place and has now or ended up in a very hopeful one, which I think was really lovely at the end of the story. And yeah. so many of the themes in the book are so timely, you know, sort of this idea of loneliness and belonging and, mm -hmm. and you know, sort of identity and feeling displaced, mm -hmm. um, making unlikely connections with, with people. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously so many of us can relate to that, particularly as, you know, being immigrants ourselves or being children of immigrants right. in this country um, and sort of how that feels. So, you know, the characters are incredible and I love how, you know, they all sort of start off, it seems, suppressing um, aspects of who they really are and only through the interactions and relationships with mm. each other, they really, they build on who, and bring out really their own personalities by playing off of one another. Well, I love that, thank you for saying that because really that was the, you know, what I like to tell people is when I first started writing uh, the Huddit character, I was actually at a writing residency in Provincetown uh, that Colin McCann, the amazing novelist Colin McCann, was running. And one of the exercises he gave us in that class, which is really instructive to anybody who's writing, and I'm not sure if this was an exercise that he created or if it might have been when he was passing along to us, and I happened to be writing, beginning to write that character at the time. This was 2010, so it gives you an idea of how long ago this was. And uh, he said, you know, write, you know, describe the strangest person your character has ever met. And the challenge of that is that it's not the strangest person you've ever met. It's the strangest person your character has met. So it gives you a certain challenge to see the world through that person's eyes and think about the things that would be challenging or confounding in a lot of ways and funny in a lot of ways. And that was really fortuitous to happen at the beginning of my writing process because I knew already the book was going to be composed of interactions like that, that there were going to be people who bumped up against each other who were of completely different mindsets and that the comedy would result from that misunderstanding. So that was very conscious on my part to do that and I'm glad that you noticed that because that's a real crux of the book as you yeah. go through. So, so tell us a little bit more about kind of where the origin of the story came from, some of the characters we've heard about, yeah. all right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know you've got a lot that you drew on from your own experience and your right. family and sort of your own parents who are from India mm -hmm. and their kind of romanticism about America mm -hmm. and maybe how that had changed sort of over the years. Well, you know, it was at a certain point, you know, I, I Years ago, my thesis advisor, actually, when we were at Princeton, was David Ubershoff, who's a wonderful novelist, uh, who, among other things, wrote the book that became The Danish Girl, which became that amazing movie. And uh, David gave me a really amazing piece, and he was a publishing mentor, too, because he's a very brilliant editor. And he gave me a really amazing piece of advice when I was his advisee, where he said, just tell the story, you know, like, you know, meaning the way I kind of explain that now is that 
you know, if you've been trained as a writer, if you've been writing, if you've been exercising that muscle, muscle so to speak, at a certain point, you have to trust your creative worldview and your general worldview of how you see things and tell the story that you really are, are meant to tell and that you're meaning to tell in the sense that I kind of synthesized all these things about what I learned from writing my first book, what I've learned from my own life, what I've read and learned from other people, and, and kind of thought, you know, I can't get held up on checking off boxes or, you know, um, trying to fill what I think are sort of conventional ideas of what a novel should do or what my fiction should be doing, but really focus on these characters and see how I really envision them. And in a way, I mean, the Hudup character had a real life connection in that sense, but like Ranjana and Prashant and some of the other people, they're really a synthesis of all these other things that I brought in. And I really just sort of trusted that to keep, give me momentum through the book. I was saying this earlier at a, an event I did in May here in New York, and this is sort of a shoddy metaphor, but I kind of think of, of you know, like the writer's brain as being a crystal ball, and you take a hammer in a way, and you just take it and you shatter that ball, and the shards go everywhere. And that's, that's your book, in a way. Like, all those shards are characters that have come from your mind. And they all look different, and they all are different sizes and shapes, and they, they may reflect different things, but that's kind of the way it happens. You know, it is part of you. Like, people, and, and we say often that, the more dangerous thing than people assuming that like the main character is you is people assuming that every character is you, so right. to speak. And in a way, they are, because they're coming from your mind. But they, at a certain point, you have to trust your instincts and your creative verve to be able to fashion that in a certain way where it just doesn't seem like you again and again. Yeah. Um, should we do a quick reading? Yeah, I'll read from uh, the very beginning. So no spoiler alerts here. <laughs> Uh, spoiler alert, you'll love it. No, I'm joking. Uh, uh, so I'm just going to uh, read from the very beginning uh, uh, of the book. So here we go. Harith descended the rubber-coated stairs of the bus and tripped as he jumped to the sidewalk below. He turned around to see if anyone had noticed, but the bus was already pulling away, leaving a dispersing cloud of smoke and people. It was a short walk from the bus stop to his house, but within 10 paces he began to sweat. The heat seemed so hot here because the surroundings didn't look as if they could stand it any more than the residents. The thick roofs, many shingled and arched, the roads bracketed in deep curbs, and the trees, branches bursting and then shivering in leaves, were all suited to a cold landscape. Harith had seen this theory proven during his first winter in Cleveland, when snow piled on top of those shingles, nestled into those curbs, and spackled the leaves in ice. But in the summer, the neighborhood seemed like a tired old man who could not endure such exertion. The house in which Haritz lived stood opposite a large baseball field. The field was surrounded by a sextet of light posts so large that they could have constituted a new seven wonders of the world had another counterpart been shoved into the ground. It seemed that a different group of boys appeared on the field every night, clad in uniforms of red, yellow, and gray polyester, or, during practice games, an assortment of sweats and mesh. Their haulers would last until 9 p.m. when the lights would shut off with an ear-splitting pucker. The field's diamond was on the opposite side of where the bus stopped and Hudditz's house stood, so he didn't have to interact with the kids very often. But there were those afternoons when a ball would find its way to Hudditz's side of the field and some fragile little kid would run over to get the ball and look terrified that Hudditz was going to do something awful to him. There was that quick shake of the head, a short no, and Hudditz, who should have learned to look in front of himself and not at others by now, would move away. Today, thankfully, he had an uneventful walk home, and when he slid his key into the back door of his house, he had one second of peace. But as soon as he turned that key, it was time to get into costume. He wasn't sure why he put the rose oil on anymore. It had seeped into his skin by now. Teddy had already sniffed him and asked him why he had started to smell like someone named the Dowager Countess, whom Hudith didn't know, but who, according to the tinny voice that Teddy used to say her name, sounded like a very small woman. Hudith cursed himself when he remembered that he had run out of lipstick yesterday. Luckily, he had a bit of raspberry chapstick left, and a few heavy circles around his mouth pretty much did the trick. The sari that he had been using for the past week was beautiful, a peacock blue, but he had started to smell in its folds a stale version of his own pungent body odor. He tipped the bottle of rose oil against his index finger and, trying not to stain the fabric, flicked small droplets onto it. He then whipped the sari into the air the way he did with his blanket when making up his bed in the morning. He sniffed the sari again. There was still the unmistakable sourness, but the rose oil now clouded it enough that his mother's old nostrils would not detect the smell. She was in her armchair in the living room, and the stereo was going. 
Gita Libby had brought a new batch of cassettes for her, and the latest one was a Muhammad Rafi Best Of collection. That voice, normally lively, was so muffled by the old stereo speakers that it sounded as if poor Muhammad himself were trapped inside the machine. Harith, for all the sadness of the situation, had to stifle a laugh as he looked at his mother, the sentinel of a caged megastar singer. She had taken to wearing a pair of eyeglasses, uh, sorry, purple sun, uh, sorry, uh, gigantic purple rimmed sunglasses, also a gift from Gita Lidi, which made Harith's job both easier and harder. Easier because they filtered out such mistakes as his chapstick lips, harder because they made his mother even more inhuman and unapproachable. Her eyes, even under the gossamer of burgeoning cataracts, were a pair of darting, glimmering circles that were abnorm abnormally large for her face and that had often made people mistake her for a South Indian instead of a Punjabi. But now with her new eyewear, she had become a wax figure of herself, an effigy upon which some child had played a prank. Still, something in her defied total weakness. The way that her mottled hands rested on the chair's armrests, the way that her white sari, though jaundiced with time and overuse, flowed like the raiment of Saraswati, the way that her hair, ghastly white, held its buns save for a few defiant wisps, it all emphasized her determination to mourn forever. Is that you? his mother asked in Hindi. It was always the first thing that she said. She didn't speak English anymore, and she used the informal you in a childlike manner. Harith gave his usual response. Yes, mother, it is Swati. It's done there. Yeah. So um, what that establishes is that uh, what, what's happening in that scene is that you find out that Harith's sister Swati, who was his confidant and really only friend, um, has passed away in, in, a, in a circumstance that you find out later in the book. And so to his mother, whose eyesight is dimming, he thinks to kind of keep them both sane, he will dress up in her saris every night. So that's how the book begin, begins, and that introduces Which his is, character. It's great. It's really captivating, because you're, you know, like, it's, the description is incredible, mm -hmm. and then you're always, you're thinking, you know, what is going on? Like, and it gets funny, by the way. Everybody's like, this is supposed to be a funny book? That's like, that's <laughs> so depressing. Uh, it is really it's funny. It's laugh out loud. It's a thrill ride. <laughs> of the year, let me tell you. <laughs> um, one last question for me, from me, and then I'll open it up to the audience. But you know, there's there's a lot of um, you know some of the subplots in the book talk about the Indian immigrant community mm -hmm. um, in this town, um, and then there are some who are sort of outsiders to that who come in. And I think you know you, I would think, growing up, kind of felt caught kind of between those two things, right. and. Um, you know, how did you yourself, in, in writing this as well, kind of reconcile that idea of immigrant enclave community and mm -hmm. you know what your parents know and how they live their life, versus this what became this very sort of diverse global lifestyle that you built for yourself, right? And maybe right. kind of you know how you, they reacted to sort of your evolution, sort of away from what they knew into something. I mean, I often say to people that I have the, I'm in the very luxurious position that nobody about whom I care dearly or whom I think to care dearly about me ever had a great issue with my coming out. I mean, that's a, that is a luxury. I mean, I think I don't, I don't, I'm not saying the preponderance of people, but I think a number of South Asian people in particular who come out don't necessarily have that experience. My parents are incredibly supportive. I mean, the funny thing is that they're actually, they had a love marriage, which was, I didn't realize how anomalous that was in our community until much later, actually. I kind of, I thought there must be other families that, that were in that same, meaning they didn't have an arranged marriage, if that, you know. And, uh, and, I, so they are a bit more, pro, they've been progressive in a way. My, my, I have a fraternal twin brother who's a marketing executive at Heineken, and my older brother Rajiv is a pretty successful stand-up comic. So they, they've been very encouraging of us. And I, I often say that a lot of Indian parents will say, do what we want you to do and do it well. And they said, do what you want to do, but do it well, mm -hmm. which is really helpful. Uh, but I, you know, yeah, I, one of the things I was very carefully and, and intentionally doing in the book was to take these themes and tropes that we think of as being quote unquote ethnic literature or quote unquote Indian American literature and think about what I thought was true and what I thought should be subverted to show what I believe to be true. And so I did think about the community a great deal, but what I didn't want to do, you know, I was saying to somebody the other day, it was almost the difference between saying what people want you to say, what's the difference between people who eat Indian food and eat American food? And I was uh, talking about what's the difference between Indian people who eat Chipotle versus like 
Ponderosa, or if that even exists, why am I saying Ponderosa? Uh, but because um, I'm from Ohio, um, so but like they, like you're having a different conversation. Like we're a few generations in. Like it's not just that anymore. It's like how are people living their Americanized lives, and to what actually they, are they holding on from their previous culture more so than coming at it the other way? So I definitely felt a responsibility to depict that in a way that I felt was accurate, but I didn't want to just retread territory that I felt had been tread before in fiction, because especially in the queer elements of the book, I wanted to be true to that narrative, because I, you don't see that as much, and I wanted to kind of just forge ahead and do that with the idea that other people, especially with the comedic elements of the book, may take that and you know, think about how they want to see the world, either comedically or a bit more progressively. Yeah. Questions from the audience? Anyone? Anyone? I have a you have to go to the mic because <laughs> we're recording. <laughs> Thanks, Henry. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> Hello, is this on? Yeah, so my question is actually around um, the business of book publishing, and as someone who sees both the editor or editor slash mm -hmm. like business side of it, and then someone who like creates a novel, how much did that like inform your process? Were you like, I want to make a successful book, mm -hmm. I want to make a book that can get turned into a movie, mm -hmm. like how do you counsel authors on that, and how did you take your own advice? Uh, yeah, I. You know, what, it, what it's most helpful for on the creative end is that I'm not necessarily taking those things and saying, yeah, like I'm going to make this commercially successful or I'm going to make this, you know, cinematically successful. I'm definitely not doing commercially successful because there's like so much gay stuff and like it's paced in a very particular way and I'm like, that was not. But what it, it gives you perspective on what's happening, well, like what's happening in fiction, what's happening industry-wise. You know, how are people reacting to other books that purport to do this? Or what are other books that have come out in the past few years, and how are they structured, and who went to those books and why? Um, I really, I, I, and I do tell people this, and it seems like a cop-out, but if you, if you let yourself be dictated by market concerns like that, regardless of your creative pursuit, I just feel like it's a, it's a lose-lose situation, you know, because you're, you're hemming in whatever ideas you might have, and you're also, it's not a, there's no originality that comes into play there, you know, and, and I, I think, you know, I tell my authors a lot that, you know, you know, write the book you would want to read, but more so than that, entertain yourself, you know, because you're sitting there writing it all the time, and you, you know, if you're not entertained, and if you're getting, like, just frustrated, I mean, there's frustration in the writing process, to be sure, but if it's not entertaining you and keeping you engaged, like, it's not going to engage other people. So the, what, the publishing process helps in the sense that, you know, going through the production process, for example, like, once you go through copy editing and you go through ty typesetting and cover considerations and all those things that come into play, I mean, I had the great luck of having an amazing editor who, whom I really trusted. You know, I really trusted her to do her job, and I didn't want to be that person who worked in publishing telling her how to do her job. Uh, but that demystified that process for me, because I think a lot of my authors do get to that stage with, like, I wrote the book. Thank God. And they're like, now, now do these 500 things that you have to do after that. So that, it helps in that respect. But, um, but certainly, you know, you see, you get, a, you get an eye view on the industry and how to engage people and get your work out there and especially, you know, have a voice on social media and how you engage people when you do events and how you do events. All those things are very helpful when you're in publishing, but I try to impart as much of that as possible to the people with whom I work so they can benefit from that. Hi. You, you actually started touching on this at, in the end of that answer. Um, in terms of how you get your work out there and have a presence on social media, can you talk a little bit about some of the things you've done to promote your work, perhaps how you've incorporated your cabaret background or your singing, just, I mean, if there happens to be anything yeah. like that, but also just how, how you build a public presence and persona as a writer. Well, that's a great question. I mean, I, there's a term that people use a lot now, which is being a good literary citizen. Uh, the idea that, you know, if you want to write and if you want to be part of the world of writing and publishing is you have to read a great deal and you have to support the writers and the books that you really love. I mean, and that's, that is the wonderful thing about social media is that it's connected people in that way. Like uh, the writer, one writer who's amazing on, on Twitter and she's just a lovely person is Celeste Ng who wrote this book, Effort to Everything I Never Told You, which is an amazing book and her new book, Little Fires Everywhere, comes out this fall. And Celeste is just such a warm, wonderful person and she's so great about vocalizing her support of other authors and using the platform she has as a successful author to support people's writing. And 
you know, I, I, I knew her only a little bit through Twitter, and she was very kind to give me a quote for the book, which was wonderful. And I, you know, it was that kind of idea of being connected to her because we were, we were fans of each other's work and writing and senses of humor. And so it's great to be online. And really, when you read a book and you really enjoy it, you know, I think sometimes people think, you know, I read it and I really enjoyed that. And sometimes, like, you know, send the author, you know, tweet the author or find the author's email or send a note to the author's agent or something because people really love that, you know, to hear that something connected with somebody, that, that's a, an invaluable thing as a writer. So I think that's definitely one way is to kind of be in that world. And, and you know, I tell people, you know, if, if you're a writer and you're trying to figure out like how to find an agent, like read the acknowledgments of the books that you enjoy and they'll usually thank their agents there and that gives you an idea of how that, who's working with whom and how that works. Um, in the cabaret thing, to be, I'm, to debase myself completely. If you I, if you Google me, look on YouTube. It's probably the first thing that pops up. I did a Hamilton themed uh, book trailer for this book, where I sang the song "You'll Be Back" from Hamilton, but I made it by my book. So if you find that, you'll find me wearing a really ridiculous outfit and singing that. So I try to bring that to bear as well. But really, the thing is, we've learned in publishing too is that the idea of the old school like book tour reading doesn't work as much. Like people think, oh, I'll set an event and I'll do something and people will come. And the truth is you have to engage with it. Like you have to go places where you know people, where you can bring people and do something aside from just a typical reading. You know, like even I, like I'm, I'm a novelist. I work in publishing. My attention span after like five minutes has a tendency to dissipate and I'm in that world. So the more you can do something where you do something besides just reading, if you, if you, if you sing, if you, uh, you know, give a special talk about a topic that really means something to you, if you talk about other things in your life that are really important that inform the process, that has a way of opening up the world of the book to other people. Hi, thanks for coming today. Uh, my question is actually related to the first question, also mm -hmm. about the business, because you've been on both yeah. sides of the aisle, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, with a lot of Indian and South Asian um, stars and themes mm -hmm. coming into the forefront, mm -hmm. TV shows like you know, Mindy Project, Quantico, yep. Master of None, mm -hmm. and documentaries like Meet the Patels. Mm -hmm. um, have you noticed that your work uh, is being optioned differently, or people are treating it differently now than your first book, say? That's a really good question, if, the, if that kind of sea change has, has allowed that to happen. I mean, I... What I, I appreciate about a great number of the things that you mentioned is that a lot of them actually are comedic, and I, 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 because to go back to my earlier point about some of the themes I was exploring when I was writing the book is that what, what, from my kind of like life research, like what I was thinking about the category, what I found is that what I saw as the um, prevailing narrative was that most uh, immigrant literature, and especially South Asian literature, focused on a grief narrative, that there would be something really sad happening in the book, and that regardless of any moments of levity that happen in the book, um, that default sadness is like the most um, viable emotion. And what I did very consciously, as you can see, with the <laughs> laugh out loud funny section I read at the beginning, is that, is that I was taking actually that idea and then taking it somewhere else. And so what I do appreciate is this idea. Look, I, I think most people's lives, even when tr there's trauma, your, your default state is not necessarily the trauma. It's the mundane things in life and the little things that happen to you over the course of the day that actually have comedy in them or confusion in them or self-reflection in them in a different way besides simply sadness or effacing yourself. So what I appreciate about all the things you're mentioning is, yeah, I think people do have a tendency to come to and understand that, oh, yeah, see what you're doing here. It's not just falling into this rote emotional state, but in fact, you know, there's a, there's a wider world emotionally than what we typically give people. And I, I hope that continues to happen. I, I, I am very heartened to see, you know, there was that picture, I mean, I just like geeked out. There was that picture from the Met Ball where it was Riz Ahmed, Hassan Minhaj, um, uh, uh, Aziz Ansari, and Minnie Kaling all in the same photo, just like baller at the Met Ball. And I was like, that's so great. Like, that's how it should be. You know, like that it should be a people like representing different ba backgrounds and having that different cultural conversation. So I really, I, I do think people, I, I do think people are doing that now and that it's by building it over time that you see it come to, come to fruition that way. Aragis, thanks right. for coming. Um, I had a question about uh, the industry overall. And again, mm -hmm. like uh, as uh, previous people have asked, uh, you have uh, this unique position of being mm -hmm. uh, across across the various aspects of the industry, a writer, a publisher. Mm -hmm. 
Actually, pre-question is, is that common across writers to be both it's happened, it's, they're, they're people, like, you usually know who they are. It's like, like, like they're, you know, right. you, they're like spread out through the industry. And you, but there are a few of us. Yeah, yeah, there are a few of us. And the, the, the second question is, um, what do you think the, the future of the industry looks like? And uh, will publishers get disintermediated? And how does that mm. affect the, the quality of the book? And uh, will that, for example, proliferate the, uh, uh, the, the emergence of more writers? And, uh, right. Thank you for the most Google question of all. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, you, know, you know, everybody knows that publishing in general across spectra, regardless of what medium you're in within that industry, is always going to be volatile in some way. So that is, that's a kind of a priori you know, fact of, of, being in, um, in, of being in the industry. I do think we are in a particularly exciting time because I will say, like, I just did a two-week book tour where I went and did like you know eight or nine events, and most of those events were at indie bookstores. And we hear about this in the industry and that though the resurgence of the indie bookstore, and it's true. I mean, like you see it happen. You see it in New York. I mean, like there are you know there's Green Greenlight and Fort Green. There's Word Bookstore and I live in Greenpoint. It's there. They have another location they open in Jersey City, which is amazing. There's Books Are Magic, Emma Straub's new store. There's the second Greenlight location in Fort. Leffert, and, and, and Leffert's Garden. So it's, um, you know, and so those stores are becoming, what they did is they really saw the moment for, to have a cultural center at the bookstore. Like that was what it was like when I think a lot of us were growing up is that you went to the bookstore and then there was this moment where places closed and chains closed and borders closed and you're really worried about it. And, and now um, people are kind of taking it into their own hands of saying like we can build a community here. And to my earlier point, a lot of the reasons why that, the, one of the reasons why that works is because the programming has become central to them. We'll get authors to come here and speak about things and we'll do events here and we'll do kids events and we'll bring in people of different backgrounds to actually be on site and talk about books in a different way. And that has made that sector of publishing all, all the more appealing to people and all the more kind of vital to everything. So that's very exciting. And then what we saw is that, you know, this idea that, that from a few years ago, this great fear that everything would turn digital and that ebooks would just eclipse everything. And now we've seen it even out in a way where people do care about the physical book. I mean, I certainly do. And, and I mean, I love the way they, I'm like, hold this actual book in your hands. Like, like it looks beautiful. And, uh, but uh, so that, you know, people are becoming, publishers are becoming savvier about how to play with format and packaging and, and engaging people visually in a certain way that's different. I mean, I should say, my, 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 where I work, Atria Books, our publisher, Judith Kerr, is this complete visionary where she, the, the, the imprint itself is celebrating its 15th year and she began it. And her kind of porousness in terms of how she thinks about how we package books and how we get them to market, how we, how we engage digitally with different formats and apps. And like, it's so forward thinking that it gives me great hope for what people are going to be able to do going forward. So, um, so I think it, it just takes, you know, I would love to see inroads between non-traditional publishing thinking and traditional publishing thinking to bring them all together. And, and I think that's only going to help people over time. Um, so, um, I know that seems very kind of like overly optimistic in a way, but I do think you have to lead creatively in that way. Like the thing with the books is, in an editorial meeting when we're sitting there, we have to feel really passionately editorial, ed editorially about something, and the content and the creative really has to be there so that other people can understand that. I often say the editor's job traffics and trickle down enthusiasm because your liaison among all the divisions of the publishing company, you're, uh, as an editor, I'm talking to sales, publicity, marketing, and then the eventual reader. So you, your enthusiasm has to be so great that as you, you give it to other people, they take it and run with it. So if, if the editors are really looking for that content and seeing great creative work being done and, and champion it, then that will always be a constant in, in publishing. More questions. Hi. Hello. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask you, because you are both an editor and a writer, um, what was your editor's, I guess, biggest um, comment? I'm sure she or he or she had many. But what, what was their biggest overall feedback for you? And was there anything that you disagreed with? Oh, no, there was no editing. It was perfect. No, um, I, I, uh, yeah. my editor, Anna DeVries, is a genius. And uh, the, the main one of, so a lesson I really learned from her that I've been actually telling a lot of my writers is a lot of the times when you write something, even when you revised it and revised it, you know something isn't working, but you just don't want to admit it because it's more work. Here comes laziness again. You get just you're like, I don't want to do that. 
I have this creative vision and I will stand by it. So the book is told in very alternating narratives and it's, it's paced very consciously almost like it's a sitcom, like, like it's cutting in, it, it, among the various narratives over the course of the book. And originally when I did the book, those three main narratives I mentioned at the beginning, it was, a, it was a really long chunk about the first and a really long chunk about the second one and a really long chunk about the third. And then a third of the way through the book, they were braided together and then things started happening that way. And she just kind of said to me, she was like, you realize that it should be like that from the beginning, right? And I knew that, I completely knew that. It just took more editing and like, I was just so, I'd worked so long in it and I just was like, no, this is like avant-garde. Like, 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 like you'll just pull into the words separately and then you're amazed when it comes together. And she was like, really? So, so that was like the most helpful note in a way. Um, I don't, there wasn't much, I really don't think there was anything we really disagreed about. There was one section like of, of, a, of a few pages where, I felt an obligation to keep that section because it was about one of the younger characters and it was about a moment in his life where he's sort of feeling adrift and it really drives home the point about just how like romantically clueless he is. And that was like a short section I came in. But as soon as I told her, like I like to keep that in, she was like, I completely get why you're doing that. So, but it is, it's a very, the, it's a very, you have to trust your editor a great deal. And I really trusted her. And if, uh, and she was very mindful of like what I was trying to do creatively. The fact that like there were certain themes, especially queer themes, that I was not going to budge on and she would not want to, wanted to have budged on. Well, there's a conjugation. So I, so like it was very beneficial to work with her and have that connection with her. One last question. Yeah. I think we have time for So it's been eight years since you wrote your first yeah. book, right? I know when I look back at things I wrote years ago, I yeah. always read them and I'm like, am I even the same person? So I'm wondering, what has changed about your writing style? Mm. I mean, if you read your first book recently, do you look at it and you're like, whoa, like my writing style has changed a lot. If so, what has changed? That's a, yeah, I, um, I think about that a lot. And then I stop thinking about it because it drives <laughs> me insane. I, uh, I think what it is. You know, what I've heard from a lot of people who've read the book, which I greatly appreciate, is they're like, there's great warmth in it. Like there's, the, and, and the way my, I, I kind of subconsciously thought about this way, but the way my editor describes it is there's great, there's great compassion for the characters. And that, that was incredibly key to me as I was writing them. I, I wanted there to be that level of empathy. But I, um, I think that's the way I will always approach writing. And the thing I keep telling people is the lesson I really learned with this book, book and is evidenced in the first book from a long time ago is that my writing is really often about who is happening, not what is happening. Because I find that those, in, in the book, for example, I was talking about some of those mundane things that happen in life. In the book, you'll, there's a certain rhythm where a character will be doing something, like this happens many times, but a certain character will be doing something very mundane, like driving somewhere, cooking something, eating something. And then there's almost like a disquisition at the end of it where you, it's punctuated by the interior monologue that was happening to that character while that scene was happening. And to me, and to your point earlier, one of the things I was looking at, a key theme in the book was, if you're lonely and you feel your loneliness palpably, that in fact loneliness can be incredibly constructive. That in, in a way when you're alone with your thoughts, that's where you do some of your most productive thinking and your most productive self-reflection to figure out what you actually value in the world and what you, what you think you might change about yourself or examine about yourself. So, I think that's something I've noticed is that I feel a bit more um, uh, validated and um, enthused and uh, verified in a way to sort of le do that, to be like my writing is, has a certain warmth to it and a certain compassion and humor to it, and I'm leading with that. That's not incidental to what I'm doing, but it's actually quite central to what my goals are as a writer. Great. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you very for being much, everybody, here. for being we here. We have having books me. To, yes. for sale yes. at the back. Um, and we're wishing you the best for tonight. Rock Pace is actually going to be on Late Night with Seth Myers this evening, so yes. tune in. Yes. Um, follow him, check out the book. Um, and I just I wanted to close with something that I thought was so inspiring that you shared on Twitter a couple of weeks ago oh, yeah. when we were actually together that weekend um, at our college reunion. <laughs> and you said, Grew up in Ohio, somehow got into Princeton, here for my 15th reunion with my hubby, and read from my second book, Dream Big, My LGBTQ Children. <laughs> so, yeah. like, so amazing. So thank you so much for being here. Thank really you very much. It. Thank you. <laughs>